Good morning. Welcome to Austin Christian Fellowship. My name is Julie Washington. I am the ACF Kids Director and Next Gen Director, and I'm really excited to be with you guys this morning. We are wrapping up a series on the church and on the idea of being checked in to the church, and I'm the wrap-up girl. So in one week, our fearless leader is coming back. Pastor Will will be here. Who knows what he has to tell us? It's going to be good, I'm sure. I'm super excited to have him back. But today, I'm here, and I'm so happy to be here with you guys. I want to let you know, before we get started this morning, about what's happening in two weeks here, which is our baptism service. On September 10th, we're going to be baptizing people in here on Sunday morning. And I'm inviting you to join us. I'm inviting you to join us either as a member of the cheering squad or as someone who wants to get baptized. We already have a good crew of people signed up to get baptized. You won't be the only one. But if the Lord has been speaking to you about taking that step of baptism, about professing your faith in front of your church family, I just want to say do it. Don't even ask yourself any more questions. Scan that QR code. Go online, sign up to be baptized, and uh, the Lord is going to bless that decision for you. So today we are talking about what it means for the church to be a blessing. What does it look like as a church for us to be known in the world as a blessing? And when you look up the word blessing, the definition is God's favor and protection. And I love that definition because it makes me think about how God has designed his church to be the carrier of his favor and the carrier of his protection into the world. And I think when we think about church these days, maybe this is true for you, maybe it's not, but church is pretty complicated. Church doesn't always get the best reputation these days. People have a lot of thoughts about what church is and what it should be. And for me, I have loved the church my whole life. I grew up in the church. I went to church as a student. I went to church in college. I came here straight out of college and began serving as the children's pastor. So I've loved the church my whole life. But even I know that the church is both wonderful and complicated. It's both amazing and impossible. It's all the things mixed up. But I also know what Jesus called the church to be. And that is, he called us to be the carriers of his name out into the world. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. So let's pray. God, I thank you for this church. I thank you for these people who have come here today and they have poured their heart out in worship. Because God, you are worthy of our worship. We love you. We are only here because of you. We only exist because you have put us in this place at this time to do your work. And so all I ask today is that you just come and sit with us here and poke at our hearts and speak to us about what it is that you purposed for us to do. What it is that you have planned for this group of people so that we can carry your blessing out into the world. And I just pray that you would speak your words today. Everything about me fade away, just speak your words. In Jesus' name, amen. If you would like a Bible today, will you raise your hand? We are gonna dive into the book of Ephesians, and I would love for you to follow along in a Bible. We've got hard copies of Spanish and English. The group is coming down to pass those out. And we're going to be in the book of Ephesians. We're going to start in chapter 1. We're going to jump to chapter 2. We're going to go to chapter 4. We're going to do it all, you guys. I love the book of Ephesians. But as we, as we jump in, I want to give you a little background on the book of Ephesians. So Paul, the Apostle Paul, wrote Ephesians to the church at Ephesus. Now the church in Ephesus is in a city um, that's part of the Roman Empire that's a very important city. It's a bustling city, trade, commerce, going through all the time. They've got a big port on the Mediterranean Sea. There's people in and out all the time. It's a very powerful city. It's a very secular city. It's a very diverse city. Does that sound familiar? It sounds familiar to me. And and so Paul writes this book, this letter, 
to the church at Ephesus while he's in prison. But see, 10 years prior, Paul had been in Ephesus, and he had spent two to three years with the Ephesian people, teaching them about Jesus, growing the church, nurturing the church. It was one of the longest periods of time that Paul spent anywhere. And he kind of parked himself in the city of Ephesus, and he just poured into this church. So what you know if you read the book of Ephesians is that Paul loved this church. He had a great affection for them. And he writes this letter 10 years after he's been with them from his prison cell because he wants the Ephesians to know who they are. He wants them to know what kind of church God created them to be. He wants them to understand how God created them to live. And so as we read this book today, I want you to have that background because Paul's not just writing this letter to the church of Ephesus. He's writing this letter to the church in Austin. He's writing it to us because he knew that this letter would get passed around. And I don't know if Paul knew that this letter would end up in the the Bible and would be part of God's word, but I know this letter was inspired by God. It was spoken through Paul, inspired by God, and it's for us, you guys. And Paul is about to tell the Ephesians, this is who you are in Jesus. And this is his plan for you in this world. And so when we hear this today, when you hear me read this scripture, when you read along with me, I want you to know he's also saying that to you. This is who you are, okay? So we're gonna start in verse one, I'm sorry, not verse one, chapter one, verses 22 and 23, the very end of chapter one. And Paul begins Ephesians by by simply explaining to them what the church is, how the church is, is designed by God. This is what he says, verse 22. And he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So Paul's talking here and he's saying, okay, God, he took Jesus and he put everything under his feet, right? He put everything under Jesus' feet. And he made him as head of the church. So so Paul is explaining the organizational structure of the church, right? Jesus is the head, and we're all under his feet. And he says the church is, verse 23 says, the church is his body. Okay, so Jesus is the head, and we're the body. And, And he says the church is the fullness of Jesus. You see, the church is Jesus on earth. It's the extension of who Jesus is out into the world. Paul says, that's who you are, church at Ephesus. That's who you are, church of Austin. Okay, you're the fullness of Jesus' body on the earth. And then he skips, we're gonna skip down. I'd really love to read all of Ephesians 2 to you guys, but I don't wanna be that person that keeps us here for two hours, so... We're gonna, we're, gonna, we're gonna skip around a little bit, but he, going down to verse four in chapter two, this, Paul has set the stage, here's what the church is. Now he's gonna say, here's who you are, okay? So verse four, he says, but God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. And then if you'll go down with me to verse eight, he says this, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So Paul says, Ephesians, listen to me. You were dead in your sin. There was no hope for you. And I came to you with the message of Jesus and Jesus made you alive through his grace, through his forgiveness. He says, it's nothing you did. Don't boast. Nothing you can do can save yourself. But but through the grace of Jesus Christ, through the favor of God's forgiveness, through Jesus' death and resurrection on the cross, you can be saved. 
But then he goes on. He doesn't stop there. And that's what I love. He doesn't stop there. He says, verse 10, for we are his workmanship. That word workmanship in other versions, if you have a different version today, is also translated masterpiece. We are his masterpiece. And he says, we were created in Christ Jesus for good works, which he prepared in advance that we should walk in them. I want you to think about that. You are his workmanship, his masterpiece. The Greek word there is the word poema, the word poem. You are this beautiful creation of Jesus Christ. And God says, long ago, before anyone knew you, I prepared good work for you to do. I shared this message with our kids last weekend. Just happened to be the message. And I told them, I said, did you know the day you were born, God already had good work planned for you to do? And you know what? Those kids believed me. Their hands shot up. They knew, oh yeah, I've got, God has big plans for me. I love that about kids. They totally believe it when God says something. You guys, do we believe it when God says, I have good work prepared in advance for you to do? Yeah, okay. David Guzik says this about God's love. He says, God's love is a transforming love. It meets us right where we are at. But when we receive this love, it always takes us where we should be going. The love of God that saves my soul will also change my life. And what I want us to remember today from Paul's work here in Ephesians is God's grace comes to us not just so that we are saved from death, but so that we are saved for the good work he has planned for us to do. It transforms us into that beautiful masterpiece so that, as he said in chapter one, we can bring glory to the church. Remember when Emily taught us a few weeks ago, she said the church exists to bring glory to God. We exist to bring God glory. And we do that through the transforming power of Jesus Christ in all of us. That's what Kenton talked about to us. He said, you gotta have the transforming work so that your identity is planted in Christ and not in other things. And so Paul says to the Ephesians, I want you to remember not just that you are saved by grace, but that you are saved for the good work that God prepared for you to do. And so I asked myself as I was reading these passages from Ephesians, why is it that so many of us aren't doing the good work that God prepared for us to do? If we believe that God has made us to do good things, if we believe that he has created us to be carriers of his blessing into the world, and I think we do, then what keeps us from joining him in that work? I think for some of us, you guys, we're honestly confused. We're like, I know the Bible says God made good work for me to do, but I don't know what it is. What does he have for me? I don't know where God wants me. I think for some of us, maybe we know what God wants us to do, but we're like, that's hard. That's uncomfortable. Or maybe that's gonna cost me. You heard um, our friends in the video talk about what it has cost them to commit their life to serving the Lord. Things that they have laid aside. Things that they have deprioritized. And some of us know that the thing that God's asked us to do is gonna cost us time or money or priorities, sometimes even relationships. Sometimes, and I'm, maybe this is the one that hits me the most, I think we're scared that we won't be able to do what God's asked us to do. That we're not enough, that we're not smart enough or good enough or talented enough, that we're gonna mess up something God wants to do. But that's the amazing thing about God because he's not saying, here's the good work, go figure it out. 
He's saying, here's the good work. And also, I'm gonna give you my Holy Spirit. And I'm gonna empower you. And I'm gonna make you so strong that, that whatever I ask you to do, what you do is gonna be enough. So I want us to begin today to commit to be participants in God's blessing, to participate in the church, to not just come in and sit, to not just come in and sing, um, to not check a box, but to come in and say, I am a participant in the good work that God has called me to do. He's invited me in. And all I have to do is say yes, right? Participation in the church means that we exist to bless others. We exist to bless the world. We are the carriers of God's favor and blessing. And I don't know if you've walked around in the world lately, but that world is hurting. They are desperate. They are overwhelmed. They are fearful. And God's only plan of hope for them goes through us. His plan is Jesus, but we are the carriers of Jesus. When Jesus spoke to his disciples while he was still on earth, he said to them, I'm gonna build my church on you. And he said, I'm gonna put my kingdom into that church. And he said, nothing will stand against it. Not even the gates of hell will come against that because I'm going to put my kingdom into that church. And you guys, we are the answer to a world that is hurting and desperate and sad. And God is inviting us in to do the work that he planned specifically for each one of us. It's not the same for everybody. He has a specific work for each one of us. Paul in Ephesians 4, he skips, uh, skipping down just a little bit, he's talking to them about who they can be as the church. And he's telling them, look, the world is gonna come at you. It's gonna toss you around. It's gonna try to convince you that you're not good enough. The devil's gonna come. He's gonna lie to you. And Paul says, but we're not gonna listen to any of that, church. Ephesians 4, starting in verse 15, he says, we're not gonna listen to that. He says, rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Y'all, I love the metaphor of the body as the church and Jesus as the head, okay? Because Ephesians 4, Paul tells us, listen, we have to grow up into the right kind of body. We have to become who God created us to be. We have to remember that Jesus is the head. We're not in charge, you guys. We're the body. He's the head, okay? And, and we have to remember that the whole body is joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped. So he's saying, I'm equipping the body and we need every single part. There's no part that is not needed. So every person sitting here, you're all needed. Every joint, every tendon, every sinew. You guys, we are not a 12-year-old boy who can eat a pizza and then go out and run a marathon. That's not us, okay? We're 40-year-olds. We go to sleep and our shoulder hurts, right? And we don't know why, okay? We need all of us. <laughs> We need all of us. We need the whole body working together because I think most of us know what it feels like when the body is not working together, right? And how hard it is on the rest of the body when even one thing is not working. We need the whole body. And Paul says, God is equipping you to work properly together, okay? So I want us to imagine today, and I'm gonna give you a couple of, couple of action points, but I want us 
to imagine today a church where every person is doing the work that God called them to do. Where every person believes what God says and goes and does the things that God calls them to do, whether that's in your business, whether that's in your neighborhood, whether that's in your school, whether it's in a service organization and within this church. Where every ministry partner we have is filled with volunteers. Every ministry we have in this church is filled with volunteers and they're volunteers who believe they are doing the work of God. Where every time you walk into your workplace, you know I've got bigger things to do here than what my job description says. I've got more at work here. Every time you walk into your school classroom, you're like, I'm carrying God's blessing. I'm carrying his favor and his protection to this kid who sits next to me. I want us to imagine the church that Jesus wanted to build. That is who he's calling us to be. That's who we can be, but we need every single person. Everyone has to participate. So how do we become the blessing in this world that Christ intended us to be when he created the church? Blessing starts with willingness. It starts with a yes. I don't know if you remember, I hope you do, but a few weeks ago, Pastor Chris taught us an amazing message about the loaves and the fishes and the miracle that took place there. And I went back to that story because I love that story and I went back and I was reading it uh, in the book of Mark. And the interesting part of that story is that Jesus keeps asking the disciples, what should we do? Like Jesus didn't know what he was gonna do, right? He keeps asking the disciples, what, what should we do? And then they're like, we gotta get some food, we gotta send them away, they gotta go buy stuff. And Jesus looks at them in Mark 6 and he says, you give them something to eat. And he, he looks at the disciples and he's like, you know what, let's make this your job. And then interestingly, a couple of verses later, the Bible says he takes the loaves, he takes the fishes, he blesses them, he breaks them, and he puts them in the disciples' hands. And I think about the disciples, y'all, I love the disciples because they're such a mess. And I think about those disciples and they are probably terrified because there they are with a couple pieces of bread in their hands and Jesus is like, go ahead, go give them something to eat. And the disciples had to make a choice what they would do in that moment. And I believe the choice they made in that moment changed the course of their lives because they chose to participate in the blessing. They chose to step out in faith and hand out that bread and fish. And they did not know what was gonna happen. And so, for us, like, what's in our hands? You know, Chris asked us that. He said, what's in your hands? What can you give to God? He reminded us, God cannot multiply what you don't give him. A million times zero is still zero. But the question is for us, are we willing? Like the disciples, will we step out in faith, not knowing what he's going to do with what we're offering? Not knowing how it will all turn out, but risking and trusting that God can multiply whatever is in our hands. So I think we just have to start where we are, you guys, and be willing to say, here's what I have, God. What would you like to do? Now, some of you might be like, I really, I don't even know what I have, right? And that's fair, it's fair. But I want you to start thinking about this. What are you passionate about? What do you love to do? What do you spend time doing? Where are you spending time? And then I want you to take all those things and I want you to pair them with your spiritual gifts. Because if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, that means you have at least one spiritual gift. The Bible tells us that. And they're gonna put a slide up for you. This is one of many spiritual gifts tests that you can take. 
You can go online, you can answer a bunch of questions, and it's gonna tell you um, some ideas about what your spiritual gifts might be. You can also go to the ACF website and click on groups, and there's a whole tools page there that lists all kinds of teaching about spiritual gifts. It gives you tests, all kinds of things. But you gotta figure out what God has given you as your spiritual gift, because that is the power of the Spirit in you working. And God wants us to use that to be a carrier of his blessing in the world. One of my spiritual gifts is teaching. And I'm gonna be honest, this teaching up here is not always easy for me, it's not always convenient for me. But it would be a failure for me to not use that gift. Now I always also use this gift in the carpool line when I'm talking to my kids, which they do not always appreciate. (laughs) But God gives us these spiritual gifts and he's like, let's go use them. Okay, let's go use them. We all have something that if we give it to God, will move Jesus and his story further down the road. And that is our job. That is our job, you guys. And all that Jesus asks is that we will be willing to take what we have and just share it. We had a volunteer come in the middle of COVID, they came in, uh, they'd been at another church. It hadn't gone great for them. Uh, this man's name was Ned. He's moved away now, but his, his name was Ned. He came in and he, he was a little frustrated, a little angry. He said, I've always served in children's ministry. Can I serve with you guys? And of course we said, yes, come on, come serve. And over the next two years, Ned just gave, willingly, even out of a place of hurt, he began to give back to Jesus what he had. And the hundreds and hundreds of times he taught our kids the word of God, they cannot be measured. The number of kids who heard about Jesus from Ned Gable cannot be measured. Because Ned simply came in and said, this is what I have. And I'm not, even, I'm not even feeling great about myself. I'm not even feeling great about the church right now. But I'm willing to give to God what I have. And God took that and he blessed it. He multiplied it. And now Ned is in a huge church leading a huge children's ministry. And we are all the better for him being here. So what do you have in your hands? And are you willing to give it to God? Secondly, blessing requires our humility. This is a tough one. I think we like to believe that we're humble. Um, we like to believe that we, we agree that Jesus is the head of the church and we're the body. But a lot of times we walk around like we're the head. Like we must know better. We sometimes come to church or to ministry with our hands clenched, our arms crossed, ready to judge what's happening, what's going on. Maybe we even come to our neighbors like that. Oh, they don't deserve my help. Look at, look at these bad choices they've made. But if we're gonna be a carrier of God's favor and protection into the world, then it requires from us a humility that says, you know what? I'm gonna open up my hands. I'm gonna un- uncross my arms. And I'm gonna be willing to trust that God knows better than I do. I'm gonna be willing to let Jesus be the head and I'll just be the body. I'll just carry out what he has for me to do. In Ephesians 4, a little before what we read earlier, chapter, chapter four, verses one through three, Paul says this. He says, I therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. With all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, 
eager to maintain the unity of spirit of the spirit in the bond of peace. Paul says, if we're going to be the church, we got to walk in a manner worthy of our calling. And our calling is to be a blessing in the world. And that requires humility, and gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another in love. And I want to challenge us as a church, not just to do the work that God prepared for us to do, but to do it in a way that is worthy of our calling. To go out in humility, to go out in gentleness, to go out in patience, even with the people that are driving you crazy. It's not easy. It's not easy. But how can you be a carrier of blessing if you're doing it with anger or with bitterness or even with frustration? When we, many years ago, went for the first time to Nicaragua, uh, to serve. We went in and, and our job that week was going to be to build a house. And I was with a, a mixture of men and women, but I could tell the men were really excited because they had a lot of ideas about how to build this house. So we get to the work site and I could tell they're ready to like start giving orders, you know, and there's a bunch of Nicaraguan men there and they already have a lot of plans for this house. And it turns out they were not interested in any of our ideas on how to build the house. What they needed from us were people to dig trenches and people to mix concrete. And I saw the faces of the, all the men, especially in the group, and they were like, huh. And they had to make a decision, you know? Am I gonna insert myself here and show them a better way? Or am I gonna come in humility? and be a blessing. So guess what we did? We dug a bunch of trenches and we mixed a bunch of concrete. And the, the blessing that took place over that week was in the prayers that we got to pray for those who were working on the house. It was in the stories we got to listen to. It was in the encouragement we got to give every day to, to people who were suffering and struggling and hurting. You see, they didn't need our plans on how to lay the block evenly. They just needed someone to come in with humility and serve and be a blessing. So when we're going out to do the work that God prepared for us to do, let's go out willing and let's go out humble with those mindsets. And then finally, let's choose to make blessing a lifestyle. What I hope that we will not do today is go out and say, that was a great message. I'm gonna volunteer one time to help someone. What I hope we'll do today is go out and say, how can I change my lifestyle so that every day is about living to be a blessing to someone else? It's about being the carrier of God's favor and God's protection in another person's life. The Apostle Peter wrote this in 1 Peter 4.10. God's gifts of grace come in many forms. Each of you has received a gift in order to serve others. See, Peter said it. We all have a gift. He said, you should use it faithfully. If anyone speaks, they should do it as one speaking God's words. If anyone serves, they should do it with the strength God provides. Then in all things, God will be praised through Jesus Christ. Glory and power belong to him forever and ever. I love that verse because he's like, you know what? You got the gift. All you got to do is use the strength that God has given you, and God gets all the glory. It sounds simple, it's a little bit hard. But Peter reminds us that God is trying to pour his strength into us so that we can be a blessing to others. That's how you make it a lifestyle. If we try to go make it a lifestyle in our own strength, we will be a massive failure. But Peter reminds us, hey, God wants to pour his strength into you. 
If you remember back to the video, the first thing Brian said was, if I'm going to serve people, I have to make time with Jesus a priority in my life. He says, the first thing I do, I get up early. I go to bed early. I forfeit other things so that I can spend time with Jesus every day. There is no way to make blessing a lifestyle if we are not allowing Jesus to pour himself into us every day. Through time with him, personally, through time in community, through time in a small group, through time in corporate worship, through time in corporate prayer. If we are not allowing Jesus to pour his heart into us every day, we cannot be a carrier of blessing because we will be like a stagnant pond. There there will be nothing good to come out. But you guys, we want to be rivers, okay? Like a rushing river where the, where the love of Jesus is coming in and we're pouring stuff out and it's cold and clean and powerful. That's who we want to be. Carriers of blessing, right? Being poured into by our Savior who loves us, who sees us, who knows all the broken places in us, who knows the parts that need to be smoothed out. And then we can go out and share that with someone else. Otherwise, we get real tired when we try to do it in our own strength. So I want to challenge us today to be a blessing, to make it a lifestyle, and to do it consistently and spontaneously. Consistently, I want to ask you, who is counting on you to show up in their life? regularly is it is it kids at this church because I know there's some kids back there right now that are counting on people to show up in their life regularly to teach them about God's word is it eighth grade boys is it your small group is it partners in hope who count on seeing you on a monthly basis to come help them and love on them Is it RBI? Is it so many ministries that we have available? Is it someone at your work who counts on you to pray for them and to speak into their life? Who are you showing up for consistently as a lifestyle? It's who you are. And who are you showing up for spontaneously? Do you have your eyes open to see what God's asking you to do? Because y'all, he may come up on you on a Wednesday afternoon and be like, here it is. Here's a chance for blessing. And we got to be ready, right? In a few weeks, we're going to have a palooza. That's what we're calling it called Get in the Game. It's going to be on a Sunday afternoon from 5 to 7. And we're going to have every ministry partner that we work with here. They're gonna be here and they are gonna give you an opportunity to participate in a project right there on site and they're also gonna give you an opportunity to find out how you can be a regular participant with them. It's an amazing opportunity. We don't do it very often. It will let you get your eyes on so many ways that God could be using you consistently and spontaneously. And I just wanna encourage you to join us. You don't have to sign up. There's gonna be food. There's gonna be fun for the kids. Big family event, bring your whole small group, bring your friends, and just come experience some opportunities that God might have for you. And ask him, like, what, what do I have in my hands? How, how do you want me to serve? How do you want me to be a blessing in this world? I want to close by showing you a picture of a man who I feel like wrote this message into my heart. This is my grandfather. His name is Chrysler, Chrysler Crane. I called him Two Daddy. Don't ask me why, it's a weird name. We called him Two Daddy. He was a big six foot two, 100 pounds of skin and bones cowboy. He was a farmer in a little small town. Not a very successful farmer, to be honest. But he had these business cards that you see on the screen which always made me laugh because you don't notice most farmers having a business card, right? He had these business cards and on these cards it said, I will help you if I can. If I can't, I will get someone who can. And he put his name and his phone number 
and his, his uh, county road box. And he passed those cards out to everybody, you guys. And for years, even today, I'll go back to that town and someone will tell me, oh, your grandfather gave me his card. And I called him one time and he came. You see, he lived blessing as a lifestyle. He believed that Jesus had made him a servant. And his idea was that servants serve. Servants give away what they have. And it didn't matter to him if you were a college student or a widow or a pastor or a fellow farmer. He believed that he was the carrier of Jesus' love and favor and protection into the world. And so if you called him, he said, yes, I'll be there to help you. It's how he lived his life. It's a legacy he planted into me. It's a legacy I try to plant into my own kids. We all, you guys, we all carry around a business card. We all have the opportunity to look people in the eye every day and say, I'm here. I'd like to bless you. And I'm not doing it because I'm a nice person or a good guy. I'm doing it because Jesus Christ saved me. And he prepared good work for me to do. And I believe him when he said that I should walk in it and I should live in it. So today I wanna ask you as we close to pray a prayer with me. I'm gonna say a line and I'm gonna ask you to repeat it after me. It's gonna be on the screen, um, but it's not hard. But I would like for us today to declare to Jesus our yes that we're not gonna be a church who sits here and enjoys the air conditioning. We're gonna be a church who goes out and brings blessing to the world around us. We're we're gonna carry God's favor and his mercy and his grace to every person we meet. So if you'll hold out your hands or get in whatever position works for you, I'm just gonna say, I'm gonna say a sentence and I'm gonna ask you to repeat it after me out loud. Let's declare to Jesus who we are and who he is. I am saved by God's grace. Nothing I did saved me. I am created by God. I am a masterpiece. I am made on purpose for a purpose. God has prepared good work for me to do. So I lay down my life for his plans. I choose humility. I will share what I have willingly. I am created by God to be a blessing in this world. I will bless others as God has blessed me. Use me, Jesus. Take the little I have and multiply it. Open my eyes, Jesus. Make me a blessing. Make us a blessing. Amen. Online, thank you for joining us today. We'll see you next week. You guys.